Hello and welcome to Japan Media Tour. I'm your host, Stephen TM, and today we're going to be talking about Comme des Garçons. This iconic Japanese fashion brand was founded by Rei Kawakubo in 1969. A lot of people might know Comme des Garçons for its line Play, with the cute heart logo with eyes on it, but the brand is so much more than that. The concepts that inspire the designs are as deep as the themes in any novel or film, and they're absolutely worth studying for anyone with a thirst for knowledge. If you've listened to the podcast before, then you know what I want to do is to slowly piece together the puzzle that is Japanese culture and society through a study of the art and media of Japan. This would be impossible without examining Japanese fashion. In particular, such an important company as Comme des Garçons. So stay tuned and see how Rei Kawakubo's designs explore topics such as masculinity and femininity, the old versus the new, and whether or not we should consider fashion to be art. First things first, though, I always thought it was strange that this company had a French name. Um, Comme des Garçons is French for like the boys. And Kawakubo got the name from Francoise Hardy's 1962 song, Tous les Garçons et les Filles. There's a couplet toward the end of the track that starts with, Comme les Garçons et les Filles de mon âge. So the song actually says, Comme les Garçons, and not Comme des Garçons, but you get the idea. Close enough. By the way, I hope I didn't offend anyone with my poor French or with my poor Japanese, for that matter. But, you know, it's, it's always fun to try. I'm, I'm sick of all this not trying to pronounce words stuff. All right, so another interesting thing about the brand is that it isn't just the name of the designer. When you think about it, most high fashion brands are just named after the designer. For example, Yoji Yamamoto, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, and Issei Miyake. One explanation why Comme des Garçons defies this convention is that Kawakubo likes to stay in the shadows a little bit and not put herself at the center of things. Who is Rei Kawakubo, though? Well, she was born in 1942 in Tokyo. Of course, this was during World War II, so couldn't have been easy. And young Rei was a child of divorce in 1940s Japan, which... Was very rare at the time. Divorce is still more rare in Japan than in a lot of Western countries, but 1940s Japan? Almost unheard of. So apparently her mother wanted to pursue a career, whereas her father wanted her to be more of a traditional housewife. This surely planted the seed for Rei Kawakubo's later exploration of gender roles in her creations. What does our clothing say about society's expectations of the different sexes? Just think about that as we continue on, because that comes up a lot when looking at Kawakubo's work and Comme des Garçons. So, Kawakubo didn't actually study fashion, but rather studied fine arts and literature at Keio University, which is actually where her dad worked, and it's also where Yoji Yamamoto went to school. And、uh, for those unfamiliar, Yoji is another well known fashion designer from Japan and one of Kawakubo's contemporaries who figures into her life story in quite a major way. The two actually dated for years back in the day. So after graduating, Kawakubo worked in advertising before getting into the fashion industry. As I mentioned, she started Comme des Garçons in 1969. The company started with apparel and is still by far most well known for its clothing, but also makes jewelry and fragrances, just like many other fashion brands do, right? They, they all have a fragrance line or something like that. The women's lines were successful throughout the 1970s, and they came out with their first men's line in 1978. Throughout the 80s, Comme des Garçons was mostly monochromatic, focusing on form more than color. This is in contrast with a lot of other fashion trends in Japan and worldwide at that time.、Uh, so let's look at some of the fashion trends from the 1980s bubble economy Japan. 
First is Hamatora. This is a portmanteau of the words Yokohama and traditional. Hamatora. Uh, Yokohama is known for being quite a sophisticated city, and so it follows naturally that Hamatora was meant for so called elegant and refined young ladies. Some signature items of this look were cardigans, loafers, high socks, and long wrapped skirts. This style was popularized by JJ Women's Magazine, and it was a preppy kind of look for women. So let's look at the male counterpart of Hamatora, Japanese preppy, which popped up around 1981. It was born out of the ivy look of 1950s America.、Uh, you know the one preppy East Coast college guys in Ralph Lauren and stuff like that. Japanese preppy was popularized by magazines like Popeyes and Men's Club. I actually like Popeye magazine. They've got some good fashion stuff and even some travel and restaurant guides.、Um, yeah, check out, check out Popeye if you're at the, at the Combini, you can grab one.、Um, so you've got to understand fashion magazines were huge in the 80s, especially before social media like Instagram and TikTok came around. These magazines are still popular, but they had a lot more influence back then.、Uh, Japanese preppy style also provides more evidence of Japan's obsession with all things American, especially at that time. Add it to the list alongside jazz music, baseball, hamburgers, and pro wrestling. Some items that define Japanese preppy style are blazers, cardigans, hats, and button down shirts. So, next, let's look at the Olive Girls of 1980s Japan. Now, what the heck is an Olive Girl, you ask? Well, it's a style that comes from the fashion magazine Olive. It's a kind of cute and innocent girlish look, maybe an early kawaii style with lots of frills and bows, big collars, and plaid. Olive Girls often incorporated lots of pink and red into their outfits. Those were the Those were their favorite colors. And brands like Atsuki Onishi, Issei Sport, Ayas, Tsumori Chisato Design, and Pink House were some of their favorites. Another popular style at the time was Body Con or Body Conscious, which got big in the late 80s, around 1987, and continued into the 90s actually,、um, with the club scene.、Um, the, these girls were sometimes referred to as Julianas. And there was a club called Juliana's that they flocked to.、Um, that opened in the early 90s, though, a little bit after this. So, this style, bodycon, was all about long hair, tight dresses, and bright colors. It all kicked off after the 1985 Equal Employment Opportunity Law in Japan,、uh, which was a big step toward gender equity. And、uh, this style was essentially for club girls. Wearing mini dresses, high heels, and maybe jackets with big 80s style shoulder pads. All right, and I know I've gone through a lot of different styles here, but I've got just one more before I get back to Comme des Garcons. Shibukaji, another portmanteau. Japan loves portmanteaus. Shibukaji means Shibuya, casual, and it rose to prominence around 1988. While the early 80s saw the rise of the domestic character brand or DC trend, where people dressed head to toe in a single brand, Shibukaji rejected this and promoted the idea of styling various brands at the same time. It, it's a pretty timeless style that is still ubiquitous today.、Uh, picture some Levi's jeans, a Hanes t shirt, and maybe some Red Wing engineer boots. But what does all this have to do with Comme des Garcons? Nothing. And that's the point. Rei Kawakubo totally rejected the popular styles of the day and came through with something entirely different. It was the 1981 Paris collection that would prove to be a major turning point in the history of fashion. That year, Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto. Flooded the runway with all black garments, and it was dubbed the Shock of Black by fashion critics. 
The clothing was black, torn, and featured unique silhouettes that were not meant to be flattering to the body. Now, it might be hard to understand now how groundbreaking this was, as this type of clothing has become pretty commonplace today. But the world of high fashion in the 1980s was dominated by lots of shiny and colorful, tight-fitting clothes. What Kawakubo and Yamamoto did represented a complete 180 from the fashion trends of their day. If you take a look at what other designers brought to Paris in 1981, you can see how these two Japanese designers just existed on a different plane than the rest. By the way, apparently it was a total coincidence that they both came out with all-black collections that year, which, I don't know, seems hard to believe, but apparently Ray just showed up in Paris without even telling Yoji that she would be there. Um, and Yoji also mentioned that this is around the time he knew that the two of them were probably going to break up if she wasn't, she wasn't telling him that she's suddenly going to appear in Paris while he's there. Anyway... The shock of black was heavily criticized at the time, but like so much of Kawakubo's work, it has come to be appreciated and even revered as time has passed. She was attempting to send the message that women's clothing didn't just exist for the purpose of attracting male attention. Remember, she created all of this in a very male-dominated Japan in the early 1980s. It also coincided with a time when more women were entering the workforce. And just picture what Japanese salary men wear to work. Black suits, right? There was power in black clothing. And Comme des Garçons was giving some of that power to the women of the late Showa era. The shock of black, like several of the other Comme des Garçons collections, was seeking to fuse the masculine with the feminine. So the collection had its detractors, but... It also had its fans, uh, who were dubbed the Karasuzoku, which means group of crows, referencing the black clothing they wore. The look was completed with distressed material, long, flowing tops, bold makeup, and boyish hairstyles. Critics said they looked like beggars or something. Uh, Karasuzoku might have been the most Japanese of the 1980s fashion trends, taking little influence from American style and creating something all its own. Comme des Garçons was already popular in Japan, but after the shock of black, their stores started to pop up all over the place, in the US, France, England, and many other countries around the world. Comme des Garçons is sometimes described as anti-fashion, going against the norms of the fashion world, the shock of black being a perfect example of this and there will be many more examples to come. In 1982 came the Destroy collection. It was sort of the next logical step from the 1981 Paris collection. It featured clothing full of holes and imperfections, meant to look imperfect and unfinished. Another fine example of wabi-sabi, one of our favorite concepts here on Japan Media Tour. The extremely oversimplified definition being to find beauty in the imperfect. There's a lot more to it than that, but you can seek out some of our other episodes to learn about that. Maybe the Matsuo Basho. I know I talked about it quite a bit in that episode. So Kawakubo was one of the founders of the deconstructionist movement in fashion, along with others like Margiela, Yoji, and Karl Lagerfeld. It's the type of stuff that lay people might look at and think is ridiculous. Not unlike the people who will look at a Picasso painting and say, my six-year-old brother could have done that, or, you know, that type of thing. Um, and hey, some of it is kind of funny, just because it's so strange, but that doesn't make it any less genius. Change is strange, and the artists who try something new and different are the ones that always make an impact. There are lots of people who can make a photorealistic painting, and it takes talent, but it does nothing to push art forward, and it's far less interesting than taking risks. Kawakubo knows this better than just about anyone. She has a real out-with-the-old, in-with-the-new type of attitude. And so the team at Comme des Garçons is actually attempting to burn everything to the ground and start fresh each season. New ideas, completely separate from the old. 
Kawakubo said, Creation takes things forward. Without anything new, there is no progress. Creation equals new. She wouldn't have been satisfied had she just found something that worked and stuck with it. She wanted to continue to drive forward into the future and make newer and better and different creations. This is what separates the good from the truly great. But of course, there is a line that can be drawn between the different collections. Though in the case of Comme des Garçons, it is not solid, but rather a dotted line. Everything is fresh and new, but when you make that much for that many decades, there are bound to be a few recurring themes. Some of the repeated aspects of Comme des Garçons pieces include frills and folds, excessive amounts of fabric, lumps and bumps, large holes, and unique silhouettes. But again, there's probably less continuity between Comme des Garçons collections than just about any other company. So don't dwell on the physical similarities between pieces over the years. Much more important are the ideas that inspire the collections. Kawakubo often combines both sides of a binary into one piece. Male and female, east and west, old and new, even clothing and not clothing. So in order to better understand how Comme des Garçons plays with those binaries, let's look at some more of their collections. And I think we should start with their most famous and most controversial, the spring 1997 collection entitled Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body. Some critics have referred to this as the Lumps and Bumps collection. Critics absolutely hated this collection when it first came out, and it was actually the worst-selling show in Comme des Garçons history. However, it is now considered one of the greatest collections of all time. Funny how that happens. Kawakubo was already well-established at this point, both in Japan and internationally. We're talking about the 90s here. And as usual, she was trying to shake things up. This time, even more so than usual, giving radical new form to her pieces. Even giving new form to the human body itself, breaking down beauty standards and presenting something new and strange. The clothing completely recreated the human body through the aforementioned lumps and bumps that were added to dresses that were otherwise pretty standard. It kind of looks like the models have tumors growing out of them. Last episode when I was talking about the horror movie Cure, I mentioned the uncanny valley. Well, here it is rearing its disconcerting head again. Kawakubo said she wanted to design bodies, not clothes, and I'd say she succeeded. Looking at this collection is pretty mind-blowing, and even though it's almost 30 years old at this point, it gave me a new understanding of what clothing can be. Uh, you know those moments when a light goes on in your brain? This collection did that to me, and I'm so grateful for moments like that, when something in my mind just clicks and I realize some new possibilities in this world. So like I said, the padding stuffed with goose down that she added to the clothing made the models look kind of scary. She took something perfect and made it strange. Again, I see a parallel to the work of Picasso. He learned to paint so well in a classical sense, and then the real challenge began. How could he turn that on its head and create something new? I have one more reference to Picasso, and then I promise I'm done. The pieces in the Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body collection have actually been compared to his later works, in which he depicted his subjects from multiple perspectives overlaid in one image. In the Comme des Garçons collection, some of the pads are said to represent body parts of the models in different positions at different points in time. Yeah, these are the possibilities in fashion. I'd never thought about this type of stuff, really, but oh my goodness, it, it has sucked me in, for sure. So, fashion at this time was all about showing off the sexiness of models' bodies, and Kawakubo turned this on its head, just as she had done with The Shock of Black in the 1980s. She told a story with each collection, so let's go to the beginning of the dress meets body story. When the first model walks out, her breasts are exposed through a sheer, see-through top, forcing you to focus on the form of her actual body, as opposed to the clothing. But when she turns around, there are some strange, lumpy pads on her upper back. It instantly causes you to think about the pads as 
some sort of deformation with the model as opposed to just a clothing design. The way she primes us here is absolutely genius, and this continues throughout the show, getting more intense and exaggerated. Think about the title of the show, Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body. The two are coming together. It's no longer just clothes on a body or a body in some clothes, but rather the body and the clothing have become fused into one being. Comme des Garçons created life in this show. I see it as much more of an art show than a fashion show. I'm not sure if Kawakubo would agree, though, as I've heard a few different quotes attributed to her on the subject. One said that she believes that fashion and art are two separate things, with the wearer of clothing being an active participant in the process, whereas the observer of a painting is passive. But what about observers of a fashion show? We aren't active in the process, but anyway... I believe fashion to be art, just a distinct form of art. And Comme des Garçons is the epitome of this. I think art is just a wide net that covers many things. And just because I say something's art doesn't mean fashion is exactly the same as a painting. Obviously, I I don't even need to go down this road. Anyway, no need to get bogged down in definitions. The point is, this show is incredible, even if critics at the time weren't ready for it yet. Dress Meets Body brings up another conversation, though, that of plastic surgery and body modification surgeries, changing our nature into something altogether unnatural, just as Kawakubo had done with her collection. This is more relevant than ever in the digital age we live in now, between photo editing and celebrity worship, all this stuff. It just seems like the perfect time to revisit this collection. While most clothes accentuate bodies to make them look more desirable, Body meets dress, dress meets body, made them look worse in a way, destroying idealized beauty. This collection recreated the human form through wearable art. It's kind of the same thing clothing has done right from the very beginning, though. It covers up our body and we take on a new form. And from here, we could probably get into more topics like transhumanism, stuff like that, but I'll save that for another time. Maybe maybe when I talk about Evangelion, or something like that. Um, next, I want to quickly look at Comme des Garçons Autumn Winter 1995 collection, Sweeter Than Sweet. Just because it's so different than everything else the company has created. Everything they do is different, but Sweeter Than Sweet, as the name suggests, is often said to be the most classically feminine of Kawakubo's collections, with lots of lace and flower patterns soft and sheer fabrics, and nothing too offensive, really. Um, It it might not be that radical if another company had created it, but just the fact that it came from Comme des Garçons, it's so different than everything else they'd done. Um, The models kind of look like uh, Pikmin from the video game or something like that. They They have a certain hairdo sticking straight up that reminds me of that game. Um, Another collection, Adult Punk from 1997 is definitely worth checking out. This is another example of Kawakubo choosing to start with something beautiful and then rip our expectations to shreds. Um, The collection is full of really nice beige and purple outfits, but they don't look quite finished. And then Kawakubo added red bike shorts just to throw us off even more. Uh, She purposely leaves her pieces open to interpretation. Uh, She doesn't want to define what it means for us. She wants each person to look at the pieces and take the time to decide what it means to them. So go look at some of the Comme des Garçons collections and think about what they mean to you. Um, I think they'll lead you down a trail um, with your own thoughts and your own ideas to decide what you think this is all about. And I, I think now that you've got primed from hearing about a couple of these collections. I think your ideas are going to develop really quickly (laughs) into some uh, deep philosophical narratives. Um, At least mine did. Now now I'm looking at collections and coming up with ideas. I I might be way off what Kawakubo had intended, but I think that's kind of the point in looking at these. It it takes you down your own path. Anyway, the last collection I want to mention for now is called Cubism. And it's from Spring-Summer 2007. 
the thing that makes this one interesting is the recurring appearance of the red dot representing the sun, which is called the Hinomaru in Japanese. And you know what? It's interesting because Rei Kawakubo has always rejected the idea of being labeled simply as another Japanese designer.、Um, it seems she doesn't want to be categorized, just in general, which is convenient for us as she is almost impossible to stick labels onto.、Um, the pieces in the Cubism collection are really nice and relatively conventional compared to a lot of other Comme des Garcons collections. Um, they're a bit reminiscent of the brand Sakai.、Uh, Sakai, by the way, was founded by Chitose Abe, who used to work for Comme des Garcons as a pattern cutter.、Uh, Abe also worked under Rei Kawakubo's protege, Junya Watanabe, who joined Comme des Garcons in 1984 and was made head of their Trico line by 1987, eventually ending up with his own eponymous fashion line in 1992. Rei Kawakubo took Junya under her wing, which is very rare.、Um, the two of them seem to be kind of similar, hiding from public view and working in the shadows.、Uh, unlike Rei, Junya studied fashion at Bunka, which is the most famous fashion school in Japan. Yoji Yamamoto also attended Bunka,、uh, by the way, as did a bunch of other fashion designers,、um, famous fashion designers. Um, I'll, t- I'll talk about Junya more in a future episode, but、uh, he's a pretty interesting person as well. Let's get to know Rei Kawakubo a bit more, though. So, she came into the fashion world as somewhat of an outsider, not classically trained in fashion, but rather in aesthetics.、Uh, that's part of why she's an artist and more than just a fashion designer. She doesn't follow the classical rules of fashion, which gives her a bit of an advantage in breaking those rules. Her process is pretty unique. Apparently, at the beginning of each season, she just writes a word on a piece of paper and hands it to her pattern cutters as a source of inspiration. For example, the word could be、uh, freedom or something like that, and all the pattern cutters will mock up some designs based on this and bring it back to Kawakubo, and she'll say yes or no or change this, and <laughs> she'll say very few words, but they'll get the idea. And then I'm sure they repeat this process a million times until they've got a hit.、Uh, Ray also has a reputation of being, I don't know, a bit angry or a bit,、uh, a bit of a dissatisfied person.、Uh, instead of saying one of her collections went well, she might say that it was not unsatisfactory or something like that. And being the contrarian that she is, Kawakubo says she's disappointed when her collections are well received by critics. It's like that means she didn't push the envelope enough or something.、Uh, what she really wanted was a reaction, though.、Um, whether it's negative or positive, I guess the worst thing for her would be if people were just bored and thought she brought something relatively normal to the table. Uh, Kawakubo Re was only the second living designer to have a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City.、Uh, the first being Yves Saint Laurent, who did it in 1983. And Kawakubo actually attended the Met Gala, too, which came as a surprise to everyone, including her husband, Adrian Joffe.、Um, everybody thought she would just stay home or stay at the hotel or something. But no, she was there. With the, with the lights and the cameras and the celebrities and everything.、Uh, her Met show was called Rei Kawakubo Comme des Garcons Art of the In Between, and it opened on May 5th, 2017.、Uh, binary themes continue to play a role in the design and analysis of Comme des Garcons, and this exhibition was actually designed with 17 binary themes in mind. Yeah, it was a, it was a gigantic show. So, the themes included things like fashion versus anti fashion, clothes versus not clothes, form versus function, and abstraction versus representation. Kawakubo requested that there were no labels or statements next to any of the pieces because she didn't want her work to be interpreted in any strict or formal way. Again, everything was left in the eye of the beholder. 
So Comme des Garçons' main line became less and less about functionality as time went on, but other lines, such as the incredibly popular Comme des Garçons play, were designed so that anyone could wear them, and in a variety of different situations. Play was launched in 2002, and it's all about being accessible. Accessible, normal clothing. T-shirts and hoodies and things like that. This is where Kawakubo's business acumen was on full display. And she really is a great businesswoman and takes a lot of pride in that. In fact, she cares about that almost as much as she does about being a designer. And she says art and business are inseparable in her mind. Um, the eye-catching heart logo is beloved worldwide, and this is probably what a lot of you think of when you think of Comme des Garçons. When you think of the brand, it's, yeah, that's what I would have thought of. Um, by the way, the heart logo with the eyes was designed by Polish graphic artist Philip Pagowski. So if you only know play, then I'm sure it came as quite a shock when you search up images of runway collections from Comme des Garçons, you'd never think that they were the same brand. And Play, as the name suggests, is more colorful, fun, and marketable, with a lower price point than other lines under Comme des Garçons. Uh, Play also opened the doors to collaborations with brands like H&M, and perhaps most famously, Converse. You see those shoes everywhere. Um, but also a plethora of other brands. And nothing against play, but I hope this episode has helped to open some eyes to the fact that Comme des Garçons is so much more than a streetwear brand or something like that. It's one of the most powerful forces fashion has ever seen. And even if you don't care at all about fashion, there are things that you can learn from studying Comme des Garçons that are just as important as anything you'll get from a book, a painting, or a symphony. I, I really want to get the point across that Rei Kawakubo is one of the most important artists of the past 100 years. I really mean that. I understand the runway models dressed up in seemingly ridiculous outfits can be a bit funny, but fashion designers need to take risks in order to break down barriers and carry us into the future with their wearable art. Kawakubo really wants to make you think with her runway pieces. She calls the pieces objects for the body. Not necessarily clothes, but maybe more like sculptures. I said in a previous episode that the poet Matsuo Basho is as much a photographer as he is a writer. Well, maybe Kawakubo is as much a sculptor as a fashion designer. Clothing really is more than just what you wear. It's how you express yourself. You wear it every day and it becomes a part of you. Body meets dress, dress meets body. All right, that's it for our main topic today, but I've got a couple recommendations for you, uh, one of which is directly related to Comme des Garçons. Uh, before we get to that, though, stay tuned for today's bonus topic. So I thought while we were on the topic of fashion, we could talk about one of the most famous fashion districts in the world. Harajuku. Anytime I'm in Tokyo, I always make sure to stop in Harajuku at some point, either to do some shopping or just to see the free fashion show taking place in the street at all hours of the day and night. And by the way, Rei Kawakubo moved to Harajuku after she graduated from university, so I'm sure it was a source of inspiration for her. Harajuku is located in Shibuya, southeast of Meiji Jingu Shrine. And while there, you can visit the famous Takeshita Street, which is basically just a sea of people on a hill eating crepes and cotton candy and a bunch of colorful outfits. It's, you know, a mix of tourists and people dressed like Kyari Pamyu Pamyu. And, you know, this is not actually my favorite part of Harajuku, but Takeshita Street is still worth seeing. I mostly just like walking around the back streets, which are referred to as Ura Harajuku. It's actually pretty calm in Harajuku compared to a lot of other parts of Tokyo, as long as you stay off the main roads. Harajuku was originally a small post town on the Kamakura Kaido, which was a network of roads going to and from Kamakura 
during the Kamakura period, which lasted from 1185 to 1333. Sorry for saying Kamakura so many times, it's a dirty habit. Beautiful place, though. Anyway, it was in the 1970s that Harajuku became a fashion hub and one of the centers of youth culture in Japan. Later on, in the 90s and 2000s, all the big fast fashion brands moved into Harajuku, though most of them are located on the main streets. It, it did change the vibe of Harajuku a bit, making it more commercial, but don't worry, there's still tons of cool little boutiques and vintage shops scattered all over Ura Harajuku. Now, I'm not going to say that it's the birthplace of kawaii culture, as this is actually the subject of much debate, with forms of it going back at least 100 years, and even in some cases all the way back to the Heian period. Uh, but Harajuku is certainly mecca for all things kawaii at this point. The music, the street food, and of course the fashion. Uh, somehow everything there is just based on cute. So if you're into that type of thing, I'm sure I don't even need to tell you to go there and check it out. Um, anyway, I'm sure this isn't the last time we'll talk Harajuku on the pod, but for now, let's turn to our weekly recommendations. For my first rec of the day, I'm going back to the Comme des Garçons well for another drink and talking about Dover Street Market. Dover Street Market was founded by Kawakubo and her husband, Adrian Jaffe, in 2004, and it now has seven locations worldwide. The original was actually on Dover Street in London, and the Tokyo location is in Ginza. The shop sells Comme des Garçons, of course, as well as other high-end fashions such as Sakai, Celine, and even streetwear or skate brands like Vans and Palace. The concept is based off Kensington Market, which was a three-story market in London that was a fashion and subculture hub from the 1960s until the year 2000 when it closed its doors for good. And, you know, a bunch of celebrities have stories about this place. Like, either they hung out there a lot or they worked there, they went shopping there. It's Kensington Market was a, a pretty legendary place. So the idea behind Dover Street Market is that the store is also supposed to be an art gallery. The clothes are displayed alongside art installations, uh, making the shopping experience more than just a way to spend a few too many hard-earned dollars or yen or pounds. Um, they actually shut the store down a couple times each year to put up new installations and keep things fresh, as is the Comme des Garçons way. Uh, this gives customers a reason to continue to visit the store. Um, I guess this has become a pretty common thing with certain stores, but understand that this wasn't as much of a thing back in the mid-2000s. Um, not as much as it is now. It, it's funny how fast some things change. Anyway, even if you aren't planning on going shopping, I still think it would be worth it to go and see some of the amazing Comme des Garçons pieces in person. Um, they'll, they'll have, you know, they'll have everything. They'll have some play, but they'll also have some of the uh, runway pieces on display for you to see. So it, it's really cool. Um, but whenever I give a recommendation that's related so directly to the main topic of the day, I always feel like I should give you another one. So how about a bite to eat? Just a bit south of Harajuku in Omotesando, you will find Ikina Sushi. Um, they actually have a few locations, but this is the one that I've been to, and it's close to the places we've been talking about today. And it's really, really good. So uh, yeah, check out Ikina Sushi. It's a little pricey at dinner, so go at lunch and save a few bucks and eat the exact same sushi. They've got a bunch of different sets and every piece I had was delicious. And the atmosphere is also really nice. Um, by the way, it can be a little tricky to find because it's in the basement of a building, but uh, you'll, you'll find it though. You will not regret going. All right, so that's everything for this week. I really enjoyed doing the research for this one and I learned a lot about Japanese fashion. 
I have a new view of Comme des Garçons now, and actually I'm excited to do some more fashion episodes in the future. Maybe Yoji, maybe Junya, maybe Sakai. Um, but anyway, as for next week, stay tuned as we look at the dark and mysterious world of Japanese yokai. It's a pretty broad topic, but it's going to be a really fun one. Yokai are like monsters or demons in Japanese folklore, and they appear in all sorts of different movies, TV shows, and other media. They're really popular in、uh, manga and anime, stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. But until then, this is Steven TM signing off, and I'll see you next time for Yokai.